Hello, my name is Andrew Harvey, and together with my colleague Richard Griscom, I'd like to welcome you to our talk, Can the Subaltern Document? A Mixed Methods Analysis of Community-Led Language Documentation. When involving members of a speech community in the documentation of their own language, it's common to work with speakers who have some experience with formal education or technology. But what about communities whose speakers have very little access to both? This talk describes documentary projects spanning approximately 10 years and involving four different speaker communities of the Tanzanian Rift Valley area, all of which could be described as low resource, marginalized, or existing outside of the larger power structure. Indeed, concerns about the viability of our documentary methods have been raised since the beginning of Richard and my respective projects, as can be seen in this short quotation given here. Uh, the prospect of giving people who've never held a video camera or recording device, who've never progressed in formal schooling, or who live far away from roads, electricity, or outside of cell service, seems like a tremendous risk, or perhaps, in many ways, impossible. Uh, we aim here to assert that not only are insider researcher-led projects in these contexts possible, but they also result in objectively better documentations. This talk presents a mixed methods analysis uh, showing how insider researcher-led projects can produce documentations more comprehensive than those produced solely by outsider researchers, and thus of greater value to both linguists and fields beyond. We also show that especially in the context of marginalized speaker communities, insider researcher-led projects can produce documentations more emically meaningful than those produced solely by outsider researchers, and thus of greater value to the speaker community itself. Methods will include a qualitative review of our projects, showing how local researchers work in different patterns to outsider linguists, uh, such as the authors, uh, as well as uh, a qualitative examination of the nature of some of these different patterns. This talk is broken into five main subsections, following some important context in which we situate ourselves, the languages we work on, and uh, the documentary projects, we take some time to discuss our problem. What exactly are the criteria for a better documentation? And how can these be measured? We raise three possible criteria, comprehensiveness, naturalness, and emic meaningfulness, of which we will address the first and especially the last today. After some commentary on the current imprecision surrounding the criterion of naturalness, we consider the criterion of comprehensiveness, that is, the collection of representative texts of all discourse types, all registers and genres, from speakers representing all ages, generations, socioeconomic classes, and so on, which is a definition from Austin and Grenoble 2007. Comprehensiveness of the documentary record can be measured through the analysis of speech act and participant meta metadata. And we find unequivocal evidence that community member involvement contributes greatly to the diversity and quantity of documentary materials when compared to documentation created by an, outside, uh, an outsider. Next, we consider emic meaningfulness, the quality of a documentation when it serves to fulfill the needs and aspirations, both personal or communal, of the speakers. Emic meaningfulness can be observed both quantitatively and qualitatively, and again, we find evidence that involving community members in documentation results in outcomes and, pro and processes which are much more emically meaningful than a documentation conducted primarily by outsiders. We then conclude with some ending thoughts. Shortly after our presentation, a recording of the talk will be available on YouTube and uh, at the given DOI. First, we'd like to address what the term subaltern means, as well as why we decided to formulate the title of our talk in the way that we did. To answer the first question, we use subaltern to refer to a person or people who exist outside of the predominant power structure. Chakravorty Spivak herself would, of course, remind us that when we use this term, it ought not simply to refer to people who are oppressed. Indeed, if we remember Walter Rodney's 1972 work, the mere fact of being Tanzanian means one is oppressed. With that said, many Tanzanians, while oppressed, 
see themselves represented in the national parliament, have access to the internet, and are members of majority faith communities such as Christianity or Islam. The people we want to talk about today have very little access to any of these channels, what Chakraborty Spivak would refer to as conduits of the hegemonic discourse. The people we will be talking about today are marginalized in almost every sense, economically, sometimes geographically, and almost certainly culturally. Uh, they're the Wapagani, pagans, the Wapitwanawakati, the outdated, and the Waporini, the bush people, often referred to disdainfully in the popular parlance. Moving to the second question, why did we use this term in our talk, there are two answers, one of which we will provide now and one of which we will provide in our conclusion. Both, we hope, are well justified. After all, we're both aware of the fact that the use of the term, especially by two white foreign researchers like us, to refer to groups of people of which we are not members, could be seen as disempowering. The first reason is that it's a very active, uh, it's a very accurate descriptor of the people we work with. That is, it is important to identify the fact that the languages uh, we work with are endangered often because they exist outside of the hegemonic forces of the modern nation state, and that the communities who speak endangered languages continue to bear the brunt of colonialism. A good example showing the subalternity of the people we work with is the 1990s burning of a church built near the site of traditional Datoga leader Gitamosa's grave a place of considerable importance to many peoples of the area, and access to which was restricted by the construction of the new building. The people couldn't work within the existing power structure via courts, via land ownership claims, via the religious community, etc., to resolve this and ended up resorting to the only method they could. Different but comparable examples can be found again and again across the histories of the speaker communities with whom we work. Provide some context of who we are. Uh, I'm a uh, research fellow at the Leiden University Center for Linguistics, as many of you will know. Uh, the title of my current funded research is Gorwa, Hadza, and Ihanzu, Grammatical Inquiries in the Tanzanian Rift Valley Area. My interests include the languages of the Tanzanian Rift, their documentation and description, their formal morphosyntax, and the histories and cultures of their speaker communities, especially as evinced through linguistic arts and language contact. Uh, I've worked with uh, Gorwa, a South Cushitic language, uh, beginning in 2012 and uh, extending to present. I've uh, worked with Ihanzu, a Bantu language of the area, beginning in 2018. And uh, I began working with Hadza, a language isolate of the area, uh, beginning in 2019. Hello, my name is Richard Griscom, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at Leiden University. I specialize in the documentation of endangered languages in East Africa and the development of digital fieldwork methods. I've worked with the Asamjig Datoga community since 2015 and the Hadza community since 2019. Indeed, the Tanzanian Rift Valley area is a particularly rich area for this kind of work. According to Kiesling Mouse and Nurse 2008, it's the only place on the African continent in which languages from all four major African language phyla are spoken and have been in contact for a long period of time. This is reflected in the languages of our sample. The first language of our sample is Asamjig Datoga, and Asamjig Datoga is actually one variety of Datoga, which is a group of languages or dialects spoken in various areas across Tanzania. The three areas where Asamjig Datoga are spoken near Lake Ayasi are indicated here by red circles, and there's a fourth community much further to the north. Asamjig Datoga is a southern Nilotic language and is spoken by approximately 3,000 people. Here is a short sample of the Asamjig Datoga language. <laughs> Gorwa is a South Cushitic language of the Afroasiatic phylum, spoken by around 130,000 people in and around Babati. And here is a short video of Akobu Usakware talking about farming sisal when he was younger. Gorwa 
Hansa is the third language in our sample and is a language isolate spoken by approximately 1,000 people in the area surrounding Lake Ayasi. Here's a sample of Hansa. The fourth and final language in our sample is Ihanzu. And Ihanzu is a Bantu language of the Niger Congo phylum spoken by around 26,000 people in and around the northern Singida district. And here's a video of Samuel Isaiah speaking with a friend about Ihanzu riddles. Throughout the presentation, we'll use the terms insider researcher and outsider researcher to denote researchers who are members of the community and those who are not. We'll use the unqualified term researcher to refer to both of these groups. And these terms are borrowed from the 2006 publication by Felix Ameka, which you see on the right side of the screen. We'll see in the projects that there are a variety of different approaches to outsider researcher-led and insider researcher-led language documentation. Very briefly, we'd like to provide a rough timeline of the projects whose data we'll be using in this talk. Andrew's work with Gorwa began in late 2012 and continued essentially as a lone wolf style project until early 2018. During this time, around 208 hours of recordings were made. My own initial work with Asim Jig began in 2015 and continued in that form for about three years, during which around 140 hours of recordings were made. As part of a Firebird grant, Andrew could begin more actively involving Gorwa researchers in early 2018 in a project that continues in one way or another to the present. And during this particular project, around 281 hours of recordings were made. Andrew provided training directly to the Gorwa researchers on how to create audiovisual materials, transcriptions and translations, and metadata using cameras, audio recorders, and computers. I also began expanding my project with the SMJ Datoga thanks to Firebird funding at around this time, and I ran that project for around three months, collecting around 22 hours of recordings. I provide training directly to the Asim Jig Datoga researchers on how to create audiovisual materials, transcriptions and translations, and metadata using Android mobile devices. Our ELDP-funded projects with Hadza and Ihanzu began in late 2019 and continue to present. And up from the beginning of this project to around September of last year, our Hadza project has managed to collect around 75 hours of recordings, and our Ihanzu project has managed to collect around 107 hours of recordings. A key feature of the community-based documentation projects versus the initial outsider-led projects was that local researchers were all given some kind of training before beginning their respective projects. This was most deliberate and large-scale in the training given at the beginning of the current Hadza and Ihanzu projects. This language documentation training workshop was a five-day gathering whose main goal was to train native speakers of the Tanzanian languages Ihanzu and Hadza to independently conduct ethical audiovisual language documentation in their own communities. And much of this teaching was done by Stefano Edward, Festo Masani, Cristina Guayi, and Pascal Buu, four native speakers of Gorwa. A number of topics were covered during this training workshop, including a general introduction to language documentation and preservation, uh, how to plan recordings and conduct research, enlisting participants, obtaining consent, audiovisual recording, metadata collection, writing systems, basic computer skills, data backup, and even using specialized linguistic software such as Elon. Most of the insider researchers participating in the Hadzu and Ihanzu projects had no prior experience using the audiovisual and computer equipment. But as reflected in the quote you see at the top of the screen from Stefano Edward, their desire to learn and to participate supported them in overcoming their lack of hands-on experience. We believe that the involvement of insider researchers from the Gorwa community was also a significant factor contributing to the success of the training, as reflected in the second quote from the report. When the insider researchers are motivated and are provided with training in an accessible format, the potential to bridge gaps and experience increases. The literature on language documentation and description 
commonly underscores the importance of fostering close relationships with speech communities um, and promotes the notion that active community involvement makes for better documentations. The problem is that it's never particularly rigorously defined what exactly a better documentation is. Here, this word cloud was constructed from a sample of eight articles written about language documentations, extracting terms the authors seem to emphasize for their better documentations. As we can see, the terms are many. Furthermore, no attempts have been made to compare community-led documentations versus outsider-led documentations. So using the data from our own language documentation projects, this is what Richard and I would like to undertake. A first criterion we have identified is naturalness. And this is represented by terms such as rich and natural in the literature. This is clearly an important constellation of characterizations, but this term has several problems, which we'll briefly examine later on in this talk. A second criteria for better documentations is comprehensiveness. And comprehensiveness we've identified to be composed of the subfacets listed on the left here. A third criterion is that of emic meaningfulness, how meaningful the documentation is to the community members. This talk covers some of the highlighted terms here, but is more broad and more variable. But first, a note on the criterion of naturalness and the empirical problems it raises, namely that nobody knows what it is. In Himmelmann 1998, naturalness is associated with the degree to which a speaker is drawing on his or her metalinguistic awareness. And it's argued that the more linguistically aware that the speaker is being, the less natural the speech is. This would seem to make sense as it does a very good job of dividing things like grammaticality judgments, wherein the speaker is relying heavily on their metalinguistic awareness and, where, uh, and which are very intuitively seen as unnatural, versus things like stories or spontaneous speech, which are everyday events produced seemingly with little recourse to a speaker's metalinguistic awareness and pretty uncontroversially seen as highly natural. However, in Foley 2003, we're given several very strong cases reminding us that speakers make recourse to metalinguistic awareness in many different situations, not just for responding to a linguist's grammaticality judgments, for example. Examples include debating duels, ritual songs, clan histories, and names and naming practices, situations which would otherwise be seen as highly natural. Foley further goes on to compare what he sees as natural speech versus less natural or prompted speech in Watam, and notes that empirically, more natural speech is low in lexical density. In attempting to offer some generalizations based on data from Alariz and Tewa, Clamor and Morrow argue that for their natural speech sample, the pattern is exactly the opposite to that of Foley's, that natural speech in Alariz and Tewa is more dense lexically. The point here is to show that despite the seeming intuitiveness of a concept such as naturalness, we actually have no agreed upon empirically rigorous definition upon which to base this criterion. This is not to say that this cannot be arrived at, but at present, we are actually very far away from a satisfactory definition here. Moving now to comprehensiveness, we'll briefly address each of the subcategories that you see here. We've observed that some of these components of comprehensiveness can be related to different aspects of insider researchers contributing to the documentation. The first two, quantity and geographical coverage, largely stem out of the fact that teams of researchers are collecting data rather than an individual researcher. We'll see that speaker diversity can be linked to different identity categories of researchers, regardless of whether or not they're insider or outsider researchers. Finally, we'll see that the involvement specifically of insider researchers contributes to the interactivity, topics, and speech genres. In terms of quantity, let's start by looking at the quantity of recording hours produced during the documentation process. In this graph, we see that in our data sample, the total number of recordings produced by insider researchers who are working in teams is often, but not always, higher than the number of hours of recordings produced by individual outsider researchers. This potential for greater quantity represents a recurring pattern that working with community members offers opportunities to increase the comprehensiveness of the record, but does not by default result in the same kind of comprehensiveness.
One fact which isn't represented here is that outsider researchers often collect elicited data, and this type of data is often much longer in duration than the natural speech data collected by insider researchers, and often constitutes a significant portion of the hours of recordings created by outsider researchers. Another way in which community members contribute to the comprehensiveness of the record is by increasing the potential to work with larger numbers of speakers. Here we see that in our data sample, the average number of unique speakers participating in the documentation projects led by insider researchers is often much higher than those led by outsider researchers. Again, this reflects a potential that is not always realized, and there's a lot of variation across the different groups. Another component of comprehensiveness is the geographical coverage. This can vary significantly depending on the geographical distribution of speakers. Here, for example, we see the distribution of recordings that I produced during my time as a graduate student, which reflects the dispersed nature of the Asam de Toga community. I was primarily based in Lhangarari, which at the time was the only known community of Asam de Toga speakers. I later collected data during short trips to the other three communities, but the resulting documentation reflects the fact that I was working alone as a researcher based in a single community. When working with insider researchers, we find that there is much potential for greater geographical coverage. Here on the left, for example, we see the geographical distribution of recordings produced by the Hadza insider researchers, and on the right, we see the distribution of total recordings by location. There's still some areas which are better represented than others, and those are the locations where the Hadza insider researchers reside. The diversity of speakers across different categories of identity and experience is also an important part of the comprehensiveness of the record. Here we consider the distribution of speakers by gender based on the gender of the researcher creating the recording. In our data sample, female insider researchers work more frequently with female speakers, whereas male insider researchers and outsider researchers work more frequently with male speakers. This indicates that in addition to a researcher's status as a community insider or outsider, other aspects of their identity or background may influence the type of record that they produce. Also, if we want to produce a balanced documentary record, then it's most likely necessary to include female insider researchers in the data collection process. There's not evidence of such a clear connection between the age of researchers and the age of speakers that they worked with. There's a general tendency across all of the projects in our data for researchers to work with older speakers. This is most likely because elders are viewed as possessing endangered knowledge and perspectives which should be prioritized during the documentation process. This trend is represented here by the Gorwa insider researchers and the outsider researchers. The Hadza insider researchers were the only group to work with a larger number of younger speakers. The youngest Hadza researcher who is in her 20s did work with twice as many speakers in the 20 to 29 year old category as all of the other categories combined. A further element of comprehensiveness is interactivity, or the extensiveness of engagement between interlocutors. We argue that interactivity in recordings is also improved by involving insider researchers. Here we have a video that Andrew made interviewing Manango Kamsilo, a well-known Gorwa stone diviner. In the interview, Andrew was asking questions in Swahili, and at the time he was getting answers in Gorwa, which he could not yet understand, limiting his interaction with this local expert. Compare that to Pascal Bu'u's interview with stone diviner Ibrahimu Lawe, where the back and forth is much more extensive and Pascal's questions and interaction follows the flow of the conversation. So you will actually see two significantly different kinds of recordings based on the insider interaction versus the outsider researcher interaction. Involving local researchers gives access to topics that you might not otherwise have easy access to. This video is of Christina Guay interviewing one of her neighbors about cooking. In the data that Andrew had collected thus far, this was an underrepresented topic. And due to the fact that Andrew is a man, he did not have regular access to the gendered space of the kitchen. And then there are some topics which are entirely unknown to an outsider and require local researchers' emic knowledge to uncover. Here, Jacobo Lubumba enters a baobab tree to learn about extracting the honey hidden inside. We also see examples of unanticipated stylistic variation within speech genres. In this case, we have a stylistic variation within the dance traditions of a particular community of the Asamjig de Toga, who reside north of the Serengeti.
And these traditions are unique to this particular community. We'd like now to examine the criterion of emic meaningfulness. Uh, this is a network graph describing the documentary work of an outsider, in this case, my work with Gorwa. In these visualizations, each participant is represented by a node, and the darkness of the node indicates the number of documented interactions with other speakers that they have had. A line between nodes indicates at least one interaction has been documented, and the width of the line indicates the number of interactions. In this case, you can see that it's composed of a large number of more or less one or two off interactions with speakers. That is, I was maximizing my comprehensiveness by working with a large number of speakers. Compare this to the network graph to the right which describes the work of four Gorwa insider researchers. You'll notice immediately that the overall number of contacts per researcher is smaller. That is, each individual re researcher worked with less speakers in total, but that many of the connecting lines are wider, indicating a larger number of interactions. Essentially, the local researchers were spending more time with a selected group of people. Zooming in on the work of this particular Gorwa researcher, Pascal Bu, I'd like to focus on the most prominent relationship described here. That is the one between the two highlighted nodes here. The one to the left represents Pascal himself, and the one to the right represents a man named Bu Sakware. Bu Sakware happens to be a rather noteworthy individual, renowned throughout the Gorwa speaking area for his knowledge of traditional songs. In many ways, he's the Greek Homer, the William Shakespeare, or the Bob Dylan of the Gorwa language. Between both Pascal and I, we have recorded well over 150 songs with him, most of which with unique melodies and lyrics, as well as a large number of accompanying explanations of what these songs mean, how they are used, and how he learned them, which is what the recording we are looking at now shows. If the family resemblance has not already given away, Bu Sakware is, Pasqual, is Pascal's father. So not only is this insider researcher-led practice contributing massively to the documentation, it also represents an insider researcher deepening his relationship with a family member and with that family member's art. Anecdotally, Pascal often tells me that these few years during which he has been working with his father in this way, he has come to understand the art of the Gorwa song the Gorwa language, and indeed his father in a very different light. And I mean, for these reasons alone, this kind of pattern of insider researcher research needs to be taken note of and encouraged. This is a pattern we see repeated throughout the insider researcher data. So to the left, we see our Ihanzu insider researchers, Samuel Isia and Sara Kalayel, choosing to work with a relatively small number of speakers and growing their relationships with them. I often note how much lighthearted joking and laughter goes on in these recordings between the local researchers and the Ihanzu people they work with. Uh, the same sort of pattern manifests particularly clearly in the work of Mariamu Anyawirie, one of our Hadza insider researchers. Here we can see, once again, the significant time she has spent with one particular speaker, visiting them again and again during the course of her research. In this video, insider researcher Sara Kalael is talking with Betha Isaya about one of the topics we see again and again in the insider researcher data, raising children. This is a topic that, as an outsider researcher, I never really thought about recording. And indeed, raising children is something every society must accomplish, but perhaps has never stood out as something particularly salient for or among the communities that I've worked with. But of course, for the people themselves, especially many of our insider researchers who have young families or are planning to start families in the coming years, this is a topic of acute interest and relevance. In fact, we see this topic again and again among our insider researcher materials. Here, Stefano, behind the camera, speaks with Edward Guay about raising children in the Gorwa speech community. And here we see that the topic of raising children occurs in all three of the collections created by Ihanzu, Hadza, and Gorwa insider researchers, and is not represented at all in any of the materials collected by the outsider researchers. We can see a similar pattern of giving time to genres unknown by outsider linguists in the example of the Gorwa Shoe Ceremony. 
Involving local community members may also help uncover speech genres that were otherwise unknown to the outside researcher. This is a video of one of the rituals associated with Gorwa betrothal, in which the prospective bride approaches her prospective groom and attempts to take his leather shoes off, an act the groom is supposed to resist. Onlookers are expected to encourage the groom to struggle and to berate the fitness of the prospective bride, a verbal act which would otherwise be very strange to do in public. This genre is characterized by a special sort of jeering and invective, and would otherwise have gone unnoticed if it hadn't been recorded by Gorwa local researcher Festo Masani. Another example of a genre unknown to outsiders comes from the Asim Jig Datoga insider researchers, who created a recording of a secret language variation of Asim Jig Datoga, akin to Pig Latin, whereby certain final syllables are moved from the end of words to the beginning, as seen in the examples bagida, coming from gidaba, reason or because, and jihi, coming from hiji, here. The initiative to create this recording came directly from the insider researchers themselves, who wished to document a little-known feature of their community's linguistic practices. A further facet of emic meaningfulness is that of self-representation. So this image is a composite of a 2009 National Geographic article on the Hadzabe people, and it presents a series of portraits illustrative of how the outsider journalists viewed the Hadzabe people at the time, a rather homogeneous, culturally conservative, and insular community. Contrast that with the photos of some project participants taken by the insider researchers. A much more diverse group emerges, including both traditionalists, as well as Hadzabe people living their lives in ways perhaps less appealing to a magazine photographer or editor. Representation, we believe, is not trivial, and emic representation affects the documentary record in a positive way. We see this reflected again in the work of Gorwa insider researchers. To provide some context here, the Gorwa and Iraq people see themselves as distinct ethnic groups, though with a complex and sibling-like shared history. This stands in marked contrast to popular Tanzanian belief, where the two ethnic groups are often considered identical. In the case of the Gorwa, the smaller and less politically and culturally powerful group, uh, work of Gorwa insider researchers had sh has shown this difference in increasing detail. For example, the secret Manda Brotherhood features heavily in matters, matters of resource use and ritual practice throughout Gorwa life, and this group is not present in Iraq accounts. This important detail only came to light through the research of Gorwa insiders, like this video of Pascal Bou as he interviews Dira Michlai about the finer points of the secret Manda Brotherhood. He has this level of access and comfort from the interviewee because his father is an important member of said brotherhood. So to review, we began the analysis part of our talk recognizing the criterion of naturalness, but questioning its current utility in assessing a language documentation due to the fact that it has, as of yet, to be successfully operationalized. We then gave considerable time to examining the criterion of comprehensiveness, showing how insider researchers have the potential for conducting documentation just as, and in many ways, even more comprehensive than outside researchers. We then turned to the third criterion of emic meaningfulness, and this was the first time we've expanded on this topic as we conceive it. In many ways, this criterion was more difficult to measure than something like comprehensiveness, but here we have depicted a number of cases from across the communities with whom we work to show how documentary linguistics can be a powerful tool for allowing people traditionally not given a voice to express themselves in ways that are true to them and their ways of seeing the world. Which, to conclude, brings us right back to Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak and the second reason why we have decided to title our talk, Can the Subaltern Document? And the second reason we've worded our title as such is to evoke the parallel between, between Chakravorty Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak and the Act of Documenting Languages. In her work, Chakravorty Spivak argues that, quote, to be heard and to be known, the subaltern must adopt Western ways of knowing, language, thought, reasoning. Because of such Westernization, a subaltern people can never express their ways of knowing 
and instead must conform their native expression of knowledge to the Western colonial ways of knowing the world. The subaltern can be heard by the colonizers only by speaking the language of their empire. Thus, intellectual and cultural filters of conformity muddle the true voice of the subaltern. Now, the discipline of linguistics has historically been rooted in descriptive and documentary practices which focus solely on Western expressions of knowledge. When a linguist works with a speaker to record a list of lexical items or grammatical paradigms, the goal is to meet standards established by the academic community. The same could also be argued from the linguist who records narratives and dialogue simply for the purpose of building a collection of parsed and glossed texts. We could consider these as forms of solicited self-representation. For reasons which should be obvious, these representations are indeed valuable because they contribute to the generation of knowledge about human language. Is it possible, though, to let speakers express and represent themselves out of their own initiative and through their own native expressions of knowledge? We hope that through our presentation, we have demonstrated the answer to be yes. We are well aware that language documentation does not solve the problem that the subaltern can be heard by the colonizers only through speaking the language of their empire, as reflected in the inclusion of translations in the language documentation materials. But in contrast to the traditional conduits of the hegemonic discourse, Language documentation invites the outside world to better understand indigenous perspectives and ways of understanding the world. Because language documentation is a form of exploring and representing the everyday life, political, economic, spiritual, etc., of everyday people who are often not considered in national or regional histories, the potential for allowing people traditionally not given a voice to express themselves in ways that are true to them and their ways of seeing the world is really tremendous. Research reformulated as observing, exploring, and inquiring about the place where you live and the community of which you are a part results in stories, songs, personal histories, local practices filtered as little as possible by Western researchers. And this talk demonstrates that research conducted in this manner is not only possible, but preferable. Thank you, and these are our references.